All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Hemley. I'm a cardiac surgeon, Lenox Hill Hospital, Department of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery. I work with uh, four other cardiac surgeons, uh, two structural heart cardiologists, and three thoracic surgeons to provide a comprehensive care of cardiac and pulmonary, which is and thoracic pathology, to all of our patients. Um, I cannot teach you the entire breadth of cardiac surgery in an hour, even though I would want to, and I'm sure you'd all be interested in learning cardiac surgery in one hour. But what I can do is give you a little idea of some of the things that we do, and I've been asked to focus on acute aortic dissection, which is basically when the aorta, which as you know, it's the major artery in the body, tears, and it tends to be a life-threatening problem. So let's just see what we're gonna see. So just before we start, I want to show you, I want to let you know that my presentation does have some graphic medical photos and a couple of videos and viewer discretion therefore is advised. And so if you get grossed out by seeing things uh, of a medical nature, you should leave now. Or your other option is to get some popcorn, settle down and let's see what we can do. So without further ado, I have no financial disclosures, but I'm willing to accept all tips and all personal checks, as long as they come with a valid uh, driver's license or other form of personal identification. You can make it out to myself, care of the Department of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital, okay? Anytime you wanna send me some uh, <clears throat> thank yous, I'm always available, just kidding. So William Osler was a very famous physician uh, he is the namesake of the Osler School of Medicine uh, and the Osler and, uh, uh, in, um, I believe it's in Louisiana. And he said that there is no disease more conducive to clinical humility than aneurysm of the aorta. Meaning that they knew way back when that dealing with the aorta, which is the main artery that comes out of the body, is no mean feat but we believe that we can do it better than Osler could do it back then, although I'm sure he tried his best. Now, I want you to put yourself in the 1700s in England. This is King Richard, the, this is King Richard II. One morning at 6.30 in the morning, he woke up in his palace as, as was his custom, picked up his cup of tea and went to the bathroom to do what normal people do when they wake up in the morning. And his personal valet heard a crash. He went into the bathroom, which you're not supposed to do when the king is sitting on the throne, although a different kind of throne, and he found him collapsed on the floor unconscious, and he was dead. And they actually did an autopsy at that point, and they determined that the cause of death was rupture of his ascending aorta, which is the main part of the aorta that comes directly out of the heart. Fast forward 200 years, and in 1989, this is Lucille Ball. Now, I'm not sure of the age range of you guys uh, joining me this morning, but Lucille Ball was a very famous TV actress in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And in 1989, she sustained acute chest pain and went to Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, where she was correctly diagnosed as having an acute aortic dissection. She was taken to the operating room, whereupon she was successfully operated on, and everybody thought that she was going to do well. But just to show you the malignant and uh, disastrous nature of the disease process, she was recovering in hospital and 10 days later, at 4 o'clock in the morning, she complained of back pain, slipped into unconsciousness, and died. And an autopsy determined that the aorta in her belly, which had also been included as part of the dissection process, had ruptured. And that's what she had died from. This is John Ritter. Again, I'm not sure if any of you recognize him. I'm not sure of the age range of my audience, but John Ritter was a very famous sitcom star in the 1970s. He starred in a sitcom called Three's Company, and he had a resurgence of his career in the 1990s. 
but in on September 13th of 1991, he was rehearsing for a sitcom called 10 Ways to Lose My Teenage Daughter or something like that, where he started to complain of chest pain. He was taken to a hospital outside of Burbank, California, where they made the diagnosis that he was having a heart attack and they treated him as such. A few hours later, it became apparent that he wasn't having a heart attack, but that he actually had an aortic dissection, which is rupture of the ascending aorta. He was immediately taken to the operating room, but 10 hours later, he died on the operating table just before 11 p.m. This is Alan Thick. Alan Thick was another famous sitcom star. He starred in a sitcom in the 80s called Growing Pains, and his son uh, is a singer and had a one-hit wonder a few years ago, and I think was married to Paula Patton for a while. Um, anyway, in December of 2016, Alan Thick was watching his 16-year-old son, a different son, play field hockey, whereupon he also developed chest pain and collapsed. He was taken to the same hospital that John Ritter went to, where he was diagnosed with a type A aortic dissection, taken to the operating room, and he died on the operating table. This is Michael DeBakey. Michael DeBakey is one of the, mo if not the most famous vascular and cardiac surgeon who ever lived. Uh, instruments are named after him, hospitals are named after him, and he basically invented the surgery to repair aortic aneurysms and aortic dissections. So it is very ironical that in 1996, at the age of 96, he sustained an acute type A aortic dissection. Now, honestly, we don't operate on 96-year-olds with a dissection that often because the operation and the mortality is so high. But nevertheless, he had an operation. It took him six months in hospital to recover, and he lived for another two years, and he continued to go to work every day before dying at the age of 99. So what is an aortic dissection? If this is a diagrammatic representation here of the aorta, down here where my mouse is pointing right now, that's where the heart sits. And we can see the aorta itself arise out of the heart. This is called the ascending aorta for obvious reasons because it ascends out of the heart. It traverses into the aortic arch and these little three branches up here are the vessels that go to the brain and the arms. And the aorta then becomes the descending aorta as it descends and goes down the back before dividing into the blood vessels that distribute to the legs. If this is a cross section of the aortic wall and this here where the solid red is the channel or the lumen of the vessel through which the blood flows, an aortic dissection is literally a tear in the aortic wall. So instead of just traversing the center of the pipe, the blood now traverses the center of the pipe and through the wall of the pipe. So you now get a double-barreled aorta. And this can be, depending on its location, a life-threatening problem. This is an aortic dissection. Now, the thing that we talk about with aortic dissection is it greatly depends upon where the dissection process occurs. In this picture here, the dissection process is occurring in the entirety of the aorta. It's occurring in the ascending aorta. You can see two channels here, a true lumen or a true channel, and the false lumen, which is the false channel where the blood has seeped into the aortic wall and is traversing where it not normally should. And the dissection process is involving the descending aorta. In this variant here, the dissection process is involving the ascending aorta only. 
And in this variant here, number three, it's involving the descending aorta and the arch to some extent. What we are mainly concerned about are these two variants, those that involve the ascending aorta. If a dissection involves the ascending aorta, that is called a type A dissection using the Stanford classification. And the reason that that's important is because irrespective of anything else going on, any dissection process that is a type A dissection involving the ascending aorta is a surgical emergency. There is no therapy for this condition apart from an operation. And when does the operation have to be performed? It has to be performed immediately upon diagnosis, whether it's one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, Christmas day, 4th of July, it doesn't matter. This is not a condition where we say, all right, we'll keep you in hospital, we'll see how you go, and we'll operate on you seven o'clock tomorrow morning. This is a case where the patient goes to the operating room immediately upon diagnosis for emergency surgery. Because if they don't, then their chances of death are extraordinarily high. This is the only scientific graph that I'm going to bore you with during this entire presentation. But what it shows is that patients with a type A dissection, which involves the ascending aorta, if they are not operated on, within 24 hours, 15% of them, so one in eight, are dead. Within a day, a quarter are dead. Within two days, one in three are dead. And within two weeks, one in two are dead. And these figures are probably conservative. The real numbers are probably worse than this. That's why these people are taken to the operating room. If we take them to the operating room, we can improve things somewhat. So we improve the two week death rate from 50% to 20%. Now this is still very poor. There are very, very few conditions in all of medicine, regardless of the field in which you're talking about, that have a two week mortality rate or a two week death rate of 20%. That's one in five people die within two weeks of the operation, even after having corrective surgery. But when one in two is, one in five, I'm sorry, is certainly better than one in two. But it just shows you how lethal and how destructive this particular condition is and why it is a surgical emergency. So who does it happen to? It happens to, uh, in, it happens to about five to 30 per 1 million people per year to about one in 10,000 people admitted to hospital each year, such that there are about 2,000 new cases each year in the United States. But what's interesting about aortic dissection is that it doesn't necessarily only happen sporadically, but of course it does. But there are a number of conditions that people are born with that can predispose them to an increased risk of sustaining this life-threatening problem. These are called aortopathies because they're pathological conditions of the aorta and obviously congenital, meaning that they have a genetic basis and they're born with them. So let's look at some of these. Some of you may have heard of Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is a classical syndrome characterized by a number of very typical phenotypic uh, characteristics, including tall stature, hyperflexibility of joints, tall, uh, long arms, um, long fingers, abnormalities of the lens in the eye, abnormalities of the palate, 
they get abnormalities of the chest wall, they get abnormalities of the lungs, they get abnormalities of other cardiac valves, but they are also highly predisposed to aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection. And then there are urban myths about famous and infamous people who may or may not have had Marfan syndrome. Interestingly, we have now characterized the genetic basis for Marfan syndrome. And there are some out there who wish to exhume uh, President Lincoln's remains to do genetic testing on his bones to see if he actually had Marfan syndrome or not. Because we know that he was tall and thin, but so far permission for this has not been granted. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, fancy name, it's another connective tissue disease characterized by weak and flexible connective tissues and hyperflexibility of joints. The problem is that these same weak connective tissues that are causing these guys to be able to do this and this person to be able to bend their finger all the way back affect the aorta as well. So the aorta itself becomes weak. And you can imagine that a weakened aorta is that more susceptible to a tear and an aortic dissection and catastrophic outcome. Interestingly, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome does not only affect humans, but can affect animals also. Some of you may have heard of Turner syndrome, which is a chromosomal abnormality where women, instead of having 45 autosomal chromosomes and two X chromosomes, they're missing a second X chromosome. So they're 45, instead of 45 XX, they're 45 XO. And they have a number of very common characteristics. They're typically shorter in stature. They typically have what's called a webbed neck. They have various other skeletal and musculoskeletal features, but they're also very predisposed to aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection. The one that is the most common is a bicuspid aortic valve. The normal aortic valve, which is the valve that leads from the left ventricle out into the ascending aorta. So it's the final doorway through which the blood passes from leaving the heart to enter into the aorta. The aortic valve, the normal aortic valve has three leaflets, a leaflet here, a leaflet here, and a leaflet here. So it's a tri-leaflet valve. However, an abnormal variant of this, which people are born with, is a bicuspid valve. So there are only two leaflets. Two of these leaflets here have been fused to make one leaflet, so now we have one leaflet, two leaflet. So it's a bicuspid valve. And the significance of this is not only that the valve may not work, but that the patients are highly predisposed to aneurysm of the aorta. When I talk about aneurysm, I mean an enlargement. So instead of the aorta looking like a pipe, it looks like a balloon. And you can imagine just like a balloon, that as the wall of the aorta gets bigger and as the balloon stretches, the strength and the inherent uh, tensile strength of that wall decreases. And if it gets too big, it's gonna rupture and tear. And that's an aortic dissection. And patients with bicuspid valve have a tenfold higher increased risk of aortic dissection compared to the general population. The good news for all of you guys joining me this morning is that the incidence of this pathology is about 2%. So one in 50 people are born with this 
and they don't even know it. Now there are nine, I, my screen says that there are 963 people currently in the audience joining me for this talk. Let's just call it a thousand people for easy math. So the good news is that 50 of you have this and you don't even know it. So I wanna wish you all congratulations and you should all go and get an echocardiogram to make sure that this is not in fact what's going on inside your chest. Otherwise, we'll be seeing you very soon in the operating room. There is another less well-defined, and this is the last one of these that I want to show you. There are a group of people who, if you talk to them, have a very strong family history of aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection. For example, this person here who has a thoracic aortic aneurysm or dissection, his, her sister has an aneurysm in the head, a brother has an aneurysm dissection, the dad had something, the mother had something, an uncle had something, cousins had stuff, a grandfather had something and died from it. So there's, there are these family trees that can be drawn and there are a number of these families scattered throughout the United States that have been identified who don't have Marfan syndrome. They don't have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. They don't have a bicuspid valve. They don't have a named syndrome that we have yet identified, but they nevertheless have a number of genetic abnormalities, the specifics of which don't really matter right now, that have all been associated with aneurysm and dissection. So we always ask patients who have an aneurysm, is there anyone in your family who have had an aortic aneurysm or dissection or who just died for no apparent reason and the reason may be unknown? And if the answer to any of those questions is yes, then we're more likely to operate on them earlier so that they don't get a dissection for which the mortality, as you've seen, is extraordinarily high. How do we do the operation? We do the operation like we do most cardiac surgical operations through what's called a median stenotomy. That is, we open the breastbone straight down the middle. Now, a lot of my medical colleagues, including my neurosurgical colleagues, and I thank them very much for allowing me this opportunity to speak, like to use a phrase that cardiac surgeons crack chests. I don't crack chests. I crack eggs, okay? We open chests with precision and with exquisite, surgical technique. We're not cracking anything, but nevertheless, we open the breastbone straight down the middle, and when we do, this is what we see. This is normal intra-thoracic uh, anatomy. This is the heart, but the heart does not sit in the chest like you see it diagrammatically drawn in a textbook with the two atria sitting next to each other and the two ventricles sitting next to each other. It's twisted. So we see the right atrium and the right ventricle. We don't really see the left ventricle and the left atrium because they're actually at the back. This is the aorta, which is the pipe that comes out of the left ventricle, goes to the brain, and then goes down the back to the rest of the body. This is the pulmonary artery, which is the main artery that carries deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs, which are here and here, so that they can get oxygenated, carbon dioxide be removed and be returned to the left ventricle. This sac here that has been cut and being held apart is called the pericardium, and it's literally a fibrous sac that contains the heart within it. So this is what we see when we open, and this is what we are focused on, the aorta, because we're aortic surgeons. So if the normal aorta is a pipe, this is an example of an aortic aneurysm. 
This is not a dissection. This is an aneurysm. If you can see, this portion of the aorta up here looks like a pipe. But this portion of the aorta here in the middle, where it's shiny, looks expanded. And it looks like a balloon. And you can see that there's an asymmetric dilatation of the aorta on this side. This is called an aortic aneurysm. So for whatever reason, whether it's a bicuspid valve, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, a family history, high blood pressure, or just pure bad luck, this particular person, and the head is up here, and the legs are down here, has an aortic aneurysm. And if this is allowed to get bigger, that person's risk of an aortic dissection increases. So we much prefer to operate on cases when the aorta looks like this, which is an aneurysm, which we can do very low risk before it looks like this. Now, I maintain that you do not have to be medically trained to look at this picture and realize this is bad news. You, I, I believe you could show anybody on the street this picture and they will be able to recognize that there is something highly, highly evil going on in this aorta. This is what a dissected aorta looks like. So instead of looking like this, blood has tracked into a tear in the aortic wall and it now looks like this. And you can see why this may be imminently life-threatening and the patient has to go to surgery immediately. And what our goal is, is to convert the dissection from this to this. So we take out the part of the aorta that is dissected and we replace it with a tube, with a synthetic tube. So this person is cured and can never have a dissection of this portion of the aorta ever again. The heart remains untouched. The superior vena cava remains untouched. The pulmonary artery remains untouched, but the entire ascending aorta is replaced. So what do we do? We can do a number of different operations for this. We can just replace the ascending aorta alone and leave the very first part of the aorta behind. These things coming off here are the left and right coronary arteries. As you would all appreciate, the heart is a muscle. The heart needs its own blood supply. So this is how the heart gets its own blood supply from the aorta. So we can do this operation, or we can do this operation where we replace the whole thing, including the valve. You can't see it, but there is a valve sewn in here. And what we've done is we've taken the left and right coronary arteries off the aorta, suspended them in midair for a while, replaced the aorta, and then sewn them back on. Or we can do this, where we replace the entirety of the aortic arch. And this is a total arch replacement. So not only do we replace the ascending, the ascending aorta, but we've taken off the vessels that go to the brain and we've re-implanted them using synthetic grafts in a different way. What we've done here is that we've recognized that this particular individual has a dissection that extends all the way down their descending aorta. We do not repair that at the time of surgery. That is not imminently life-threatening. It is only the ascending portion that is life-threatening. But we realize that this person may have to come back down the road for another operation on their remaining aorta. 
So we put a graph inside their aorta, literally blowing in the blood or blowing in the wind, so that if we come back down the track, we can then open the aorta, access this graft, and sew to it. And because of what it looks like, this is called an elephant trunk procedure for obvious reasons. So if we take our dissected aorta, which was that horrible picture I showed you before, and we open it, what we see on the inside are the two channels that I tried to show you before diagrammatically. The wall of the aorta has been split apart. Normally, this layer and this layer should be closely adherent. But because blood has gotten in between, the two layers are now separated. And the true channel of the aorta, the lumen represented by L, is inside here. What we're looking at here is the false lumen or the false channel where the blood has tracked through the aortic wall. And what you're seeing here is the tear in the aortic wall that caused this to happen. Um, it may go without saying, but this operation is done using the heart lung machine. Obviously, there is no way that we can do this operation without the heart lung machine or the patient simply, there's no way of doing it without the heart lung machine. This is an example of what it looks like during the case. So the patient is on the heart lung machine and you can see here for an example a large pipe which is one of the pipes that we use attaching the patient to the heart lung machine. The aortic valve has been removed. You're looking down through the aortic valve into the heart into the left ventricle and the ascending aorta has been resected. It's been taken away. These things here are the coronary arteries. This is the left, this is the right. And we'll have to remember to put these back on at the end, otherwise the patient doesn't tend to do very well. The next step is to put in the synthetic tube. So this is a synthetic graft with a valve, a new aortic valve sewn into it and we're lowering it into place into these sutures that we've placed around. And here are the coronary arteries to finally get this result. These are just the pipes that have attached the patient to the heart lung machine. But what we see here is our new graft laid in place instead of the dissected ascending aorta. And we see here, this is the right coronary artery reattached back to the new graft so that the heart gets its new blood supply. If we need to do a more extensive operation, this is an example of a total arch replacement. So this is the heart, obviously. The head is up here. The feet are down here. And what we see is that the ascending aorta has been replaced. The aortic arch has been replaced. These are grafts going to the brain re instead of the normal way in which you saw the previous picture. And this is going to be a graft that we're going to take through the left chest. This is the left lung in here to reattach to the patient's left arm artery so that their left arm continues to get blood supply. What I want to show you now, I don't really want to stop it. I want to let it run. One of my partners is Derek Brinster. He's the director of our aortic surgery program. And he has a video of a type A aortic dissection. Um, it lasts about six minutes and it shows you the highlights of the operation. What I'd like to do is just let it run. It's a six minute video. We'll let it run. And then at the end, we'll be able to come back to it, obviously, and answer any questions if you have um, about the video itself. So I'm just going to let it run.
So that's basically a repair of an aortic dissection of a patient who was receiving CPR on the way to the operating room because they had a cardiac arrest as a consequence of their dissection. And they were put on the heart lung machine, had their aorta replaced with a new valve, just like you saw, and they left hospital six days later. So that's why we do what we do. Unfortunately, Aortic dissection is not always thought of when patients come to the emergency room with chest pain. The most common cause of chest pain that people come to the emergency room with is usually coronary artery disease. It's angina. But people often don't think about the aorta, which is unfortunate because it's a life-threatening problem, but it has a surgical solution. And that's what happened to John Ritter who's one of the actors I showed you in one of my earlier slides. But honestly, that's just a Cook's tour of aortic dissection. We can spend uh, a whole week just on this topic. That's pretty much all I really want to say. I'm deliberately finishing a few minutes earlier so that Joshua and Randy can come back into the picture. And then I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any uh, from my remaining few minutes. That was great. So can you see the chat function? Um, I can. Yeah, so I'm going to open it up now, and the questions usually come in very quickly, so just answer what you can. Sure. I can't read that fast. I'm only a cardiac surgeon, guys. I'm not a neurosurgeon. I am... Uh... If you just, like, scroll up, it'll stop, like, moving so quickly, and you can just scroll through them. Okay, uh, how long can the heart be attached to the heart-lung machine? Theoretically, the heart can be attached to the heart-lung machine forever. However, the longer we're attached to the heart-lung machine, the worse it is for the patient. A standard cardiac operation, like a bypass operation or like the aortic dissection that you just saw, takes about seven hours to do, of which the patient is attached to the heart-lung machine for about four hours or so and they tend to do really well. In a complicated reoperation, the patient may be attached to the heart-lung machine for about six hours, sometimes seven hours. That's about the limit. If it gets longer than that, then the heart is likely to sustain some injury and we're likely to run in the problems. How does this operation affect blood pressure regulation? The operation doesn't affect blood pressure regulation as such, but most patients who present with an aortic dissection have high blood pressure. High blood pressure is a uh, risk factor for aortic dissection. Because if you can imagine that the aorta, they can't see my hands probably. If you can imagine the, that the aorta is a pipe, then the blood running through it is under pressure. And that pressure is blood pressure. So the higher the pressure is, the more likely there is for the wall to tear and for an aortic dissection to occur. The heart-lung machine is not used to, is, is used to prevent blood flow. The heart-lung machine is used to keep the patient alive while we do the operation. As you can see in the operation in the video that I just showed you, we have to stop the heart and open the heart to do the operation. You obviously can't do that on a patient who's relying on their heart to keep them alive. So what we do with the heart-lung machine is we attach the patient to the heart-lung machine through pipes, which keeps the blood flowing around the body and particularly to the brain to allow us to stop the heart and do what we need to do. So the heart-lung machine keeps the patient alive in order to allow us to do the operation. Are there any alternatives to open heart surgery for an aneurysm or dissection? The answer is it depends where the dissection is. If the aneurysm or dissection is in the descending aorta, which is at the back, we can sometimes treat this with a stent graft, which is going through the groin and a minimally invasive kind of approach. If the dissection or aneurysm is in the ascending aorta, which is what our discussion has been focused on, there is currently no way to fix this apart from an open operation. 
Um, if you find a patient has a bicuspid valve, are there any precautions they can take to avoid the possibility of an aneurysm? The answer is not really. A bicuspid valve is genetically associated with a weakened aortic wall. So what we do is if we find a patient with a bicuspid valve, we advise them on strict blood pressure control, which is basically the only modifiable risk factor that we have. And then we screen them regularly with echocardiogram and CT scans in order to monitor the size of the aorta. And if we see that they are developing an aneurysm and the aorta is getting bigger, then we decide to operate on them prophylactically. We get in there and fix the aneurysm, which we can do very safely before the dissection process happens, where the, which becomes a much more life-threatening situation. Which, what tests help identify the dissection? It's basically a CAT scan. A CT scan is the most sensitive and the best test that we do to identify an aortic dissection. When placing a patient on bypass, do you, do in, do you induce asystole via meds or electricity? The answer is we, give the, we infuse the heart itself with a potassium solution, just like they do when they're uh, putting patients on death row because potassium stops the electrical activity of the heart and allows us to operate on the heart and do what we need to do. And then the heart resumes beating once blood flow is restored and once the operation is completed. Somebody said that they're in tears. I'm very sorry. Uh, please contact me after the presentation if there's anything I can do to console you. Um, at what point would you be unable to save the aorta? Uh, we're not trying to save the aorta. We are trying to replace the aorta. We cannot save a dissected aorta. We cannot save an aneurysmal aorta. So we have to excise the necrotic and dissected tissue and replace it with a synthetic graft. Maybe your question is, at what point would you deem it to be unreconstructable? That has so far not yet happened. Obviously, not all patients survive the operation or survive complications thereafter, but we do our best to at least try and put them back together and not to let the patient die on the operating table. Somebody said that was badass. I agree. Um, how do you get the perfect seal between the natural components and the artificial components? The human body is amazing at stopping bleeding, and it's the human blood which forms little clots at the suture lines which cause the seal. And over time, new lining, new uh, endothelium will grow around those suture lines and cement those grafts into position. Do we make the grafts that are used in heart dissection surgery? Do we use 3D printing and stem cells? The answer is no. These are commercially available products. We get them off the shelf. We just choose the size and length that we deem appropriate. Um, however, people are working on biocompatible uh, uh, tubes using stem cell technology, but we're way away from this right now. Is there a risk of infection in the grafts we add in the body? The answer is absolutely yes. Anytime you put in a foreign body into the body, a foreign material into the human body, whether it's an aortic graft, whether it is a hip replacement, a knee replacement, a pacemaker, some metal that Dr. Baum uses to fuse the spine, any foreign material in the body is a focus for infection. And unfortunately, if these aortic grafts become infected, the only treatment for this is another operation, which is much bigger and much more complicated. Someone asked what the material is made from. It's made from Dacron, which is a type of Gore-Tex. How long does it take? An uncomplicated dissection takes about seven hours. If it's a re-operation and a very complex total arch, it can take up to about 12 to 14 hours. So it just depends what we're talking about. Um, 
if a person with an aneurysm wants to donate their heart, would they be allowed to do so? The answer is yes, because they're not donating their aorta, they're donating the heart as long as the valves work. How do we make sure there's no infection? We wash our hands and we give the patient antibiotics. Um, we talked about suture, how much blood is lost is very variable. What's it made from? Um, how do we tell if it's an ascending or descending dissection? It's not based on symptoms as much as it's based on the CAT scan. So it's the CT scan that we do on every patient that shows us where the dissection process is occurring. If it's in the ascending aorta, descending aorta, or both. And regardless of what's happening in the descending, any patient who has a dissection process involving the ascending aorta has to be considered for an operation. They may not have an operation if they're 110 years old and have other medical problems that preclude surgery, but they have to be considered for surgery. Um, um, what is the surgical procedure? The surgical procedure for an aneurysm is exactly the same as that which you saw for a dissection. The difference is, is that it's done under a controlled, planned condition. The tissues that we're handling are stronger and better, and the risks are less than 1%. Once the aorta dissects, we have to do the same operation, but it's like trying to sew wet tissue paper together. And the risks, as you saw on the graph that I showed earlier, are much, much higher. Um, um, let me look at some other descending dissections and not someone asked why descending dissections are not operated on immediately because they usually don't cause any immediate problems and if we do treat them we treat them with a stent graft usually rather than an open operation um we do not use robots in this kind of surgery. This kind of surgery is old school, uh, open the chest, all hands on deck. Uh, one of my colleagues does a lot of coronary bypass surgery using robots, does a lot of mitral valve surgery using the robot, and my thoracic colleagues do almost all of their lung surgery using the robot. But as of now, we do not use robots in aortic surgery. Um, um, there are lots of uh, questions here. Um, what yeah, are the yeah. possible complications of this operation? The possible complications of the operation are anything that you can think of ranging from death, stroke, infection, renal, uh, kidney failure, uh, impaired blood flow to the bowels and uh, bowel ischemia, paralysis, um, and the list goes on. But with a type A dissection, where the dissection is affecting the ascending aorta, there is no other alternative. If they don't have an operation, they are going to die. Therefore, any risk of the operation and any chance of survival is better than none. Um, um, after surgery, are patients not allowed to do some activities? No. The beauty of cardiac surgery and why it's so much better than neurosurgery is that once the patient recovers from their operation, they can return to completely unrestricted activities except we like to keep them on medication to control their blood pressure. So the patient that you just saw the video of, who was having CPR on the way to the operating room and who left hospital six days later, three months after his operation, when he's completely recovered, he will have no restrictions. He can play football, he can do skydiving, he can go scuba diving, he can do full contact kumite, anything that he wants to do, he can do. It's a curative operation. Um, can you use cadaveric aorta as a replacement? The answer is yes. 
We don't often do that. That is mainly reserved for very special circumstances where we're dealing with an infection. Um, Dr. D'Amico, just jump in anytime you think I'm over my time limit. I'm letting um, you go. You're doing a great job. That was uh, incredible. A lot, of, uh, a lot of comments just saying how informative it was, and I think people really appreciated it. Um, let, me, let me see what else there is. Um, why EVAR cannot be done. So EVAR is a stent graft. Someone is asking why we cannot stent the ascending aorta. The answer is we can, but it's only done in very, very, very rare circumstances because you have to land the stent appropriately. And if you have the coronary arteries and the aortic valve too low, you can't place a stent down there and you can't stent too high because you impair blood flow to the branch vessels that go to the brain. We, and we cannot stent dissections. People are working on it, but it's not currently available as yet. Uh, how long is the graft good for? Can it last a lifetime? Or does the patient have to come back for other fixes? The graft, as long as it doesn't get infected, the graft is good forever. So our aim is to give the patient a curative operation such that they will not require another operation um, on their ascending aorta. The limiting factor is usually not the graft. The limiting factor is usually the valve if it needs to be replaced. Because if we replace it with a biological valve, those valves do not last forever. And then another intervention will sometimes have to be required. Um, does the patient have to take anti-rejection medication? They do not. It is not like a transplant. The graft is not immunologically active. It's basically a piece of plastic. It's like putting in an artificial hip or an artificial knee. A patient does not need anti-rejection medications. They just go ahead and live their life. Why do biological valves not last forever? It's because they calcify. Biological valves are either made from pig valves or they're made from the pericardium, which is the fibrous sac around the heart taken from a cow sewn into the shape of a valve. The beauty of the biological valve is the patient does not have to take blood thinners. The disadvantage of the biological valve is that the valve calcifies over time and starts to deteriorate. And the length of time that it lasts depends on the age of the patient. So someone who's 30 or 35 years old who gets a biological valve, it may only last 10 years if they're lucky, and then they will need another intervention for the valve which is failing. Someone who's 75, the valve may last 15 or 20 years, so hopefully they will never need anything again until natural history takes its course. Um, I think we're, we're signing off, Dr. Hemley. Okay. We're here at 12 o'clock, we're losing it. Thank you so much, that was fantastic. No um, problem. Just wanted to remind all the students today at 4 p.m. there's the cerebrovascular webinar as well. Uh, if you want to attend, the login for that will be on the Lennox Hill social media, so check it out. And Dr. Hemley, please, thanks uh, to you and thanks to the whole group for contributing to this. I, I think, you know, hopefully it's as rewarding for you as I think it is for the students. So it's been a great Happy experience. Happy to come back anytime.